2023 has brought many geoeconomic surprises. One of them is the huge progress that Russia made in circumventing Western sanctions on its oil exports. Another one is a massive increase in U.S. oil production that hit a record high last month. What do these developments mean for oil price in the world economy? What do they mean for the power struggle between the unipolar and the multipolar world order? How far is Saudi Arabia willing to go to help Russia win the war in Ukraine? Can OPEC Plus remain united in 2024 in the face of increasing U.S. competition? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. It will soon be two years since Russia invaded Ukraine. This means it will soon be two years since Russia has had to live with Western sanctions on its energy exports. Before the war, energy accounted for 50% of total Russian exports and 14% of the Russian GDP. Moreover, more than two-thirds of Russian energy exports went to Europe, Japan, and South Korea. This was why the architects of the sanctions in Washington and Brussels were so very confident that they would soon bring the Russian economy to its knees. Yet, two years later, despite the sanctions, the Russian economy is doing well. In the latest Global Manufacturing Purchasing Manager survey conducted by S&P Global, Russia came in just behind the first place, India. The IMF forecasts that the Russian economy will grow 2.2% this year, reflecting, in its own words, substantial fiscal stimulus, strong investment, and resilient consumption in the context of a tight labor market. What the IMF doesn't say is that Russia has managed to get around the sanctions with increasing ease. We all know that Russia has managed to divert its oil and gas from Europe to China to India, Turkey, and elsewhere. We all know that petroleum products of Russian oil processed in China, India, Turkey, and even some Gulf countries are then finding their way into world markets. Less well known is the fact that Russia has also been getting around the $60 price cap imposed by the West in December 2022 to reduce Moscow's ability to finance its war in Ukraine. Indeed, since July, Russia has not sold a single barrel of oil under the price cap. The oil price cap scheme bans G7 and European Union companies from providing transportation, insurance, and financing services for Russian oil and oil products if they're sold above the cap. The scheme was supposed to work because of the dominance of Western companies in the global market for transporting oil and providing maritime insurance. It was thought that this dominance will make it difficult for Russia to circumvent the sanctions. It took a few months, but Russia, with some ingenuity, managed to get around the price cap scheme too. Russia did this by assembling a shadow fleet of oil tankers that I talked about in a previous video. Since last year, Moscow has been busy buying secondhand oil tankers. Shipping brokers estimated in 2022 alone, Russia bought more than 100 of these tankers. The fact that prices for these tankers have remained very high this year was suggest that this shopping spree is continuing. Russia adapted to the sanctions by changing its customers, by becoming the provider of transportation for its oil, and by underwriting the insurance of the ships that it owns. This vertical integration of the Russian energy industry not only allows Russia to get around the sanctions, but enables Russia to capture the economic rent associated with the entire supply and distribution chain of its energy resources to the rest of the world. In many ways, Western sanctions are the best thing that's ever happened to the Russian economy. The sanctions have done more than anything else that I can remember over my 20-year career to encourage a diversification of the Russian economy. The fact that sanctions are driving import substitution and that Russian savings are staying home to finance new business activities are all unintended consequences of the Western policy response to the war. Ironically, Western policies will make the Russian economy stronger in the long run, rather than weaker. I wonder if Vladimir Putin sent a thank you letter to Joe Biden on Thanksgiving. If he didn't, he really ought to. 
Notwithstanding the war expenses and the drop in oil price this year, the Russian budget deficit is projected to be just 1.8% of GDP. And in a further irony, this compares to a deficit of 6.3% of GDP for the US in the fiscal year that just ended. In October, Russia's oil and gas revenue more than doubled to 1.63 trillion ruble from 700 billion rubles in September. Both Putin and Biden are facing re-elections next year. Biden's approval rating is barely above 40%. In contrast, Putin's approval rating, which fell to just 60% during the pandemic, recovered after the war broke out and has remained in the low 80s. I suspect the fact that the Russian economy continues to do well is an important, if not the most important reason for the support that Putin continues to enjoy. The question is whether this rosy state of affairs is sustainable in 2024. What is the biggest downside risk for the Russian economy? Oil price has been falling since September. There was a short spike in October immediately following the Hamas attack on Israel on concerns that it could trigger a regional war. But the oil price decline has since resumed. Indeed, as of this week, the benchmark crude oil futures are trading quite a bit lower than the level before the Hamas attack. I don't know if this is causing Putin to lose any sleep yet, but it goes without saying that if the trend were to continue, this could potentially become a big headache for him in 2024. So what's going on here? What is driving the falling oil price? The immediate cause is the fact that U.S. crude oil inventory has been rising over the last few weeks. Indeed, U.S. crude inventory is now higher than where it was at this time of the year in 2022, and at the same level as in 2019. Why is inventory going up? It certainly has nothing to do with weak demand, as U.S. oil demand is currently running at the same level as in 2019 and 2022 for this time of the year. The reason for the strong buildup in inventory is surging U.S. production. U.S. crude oil production hit a record high last month of 13.2 million barrels per day. The previous peak was the 13.1 million barrels per day reached in 2019 before the lockdown drove down output. This came as a big surprise, as the consensus in the oil market at the start of this year was that U.S. shell oil production was nearing peak level, as the aging of oil wells takes its toll. Yet we are seeing increasing production from all major shell oil producing regions, and especially from the Permian Basin that's located mostly in Texas. There are two drivers behind the surging U.S. oil production. One, improving technology and innovation are extending the life of existing wells. When ExxonMobil announced recently a $60 billion acquisition of Pioneer Natural Resources that came with 850,000 acres in the Permian Basin, the CEO of Exxon said that the deal will offer greater opportunities to deploy Exxon's technologies, delivering operating and capital efficiency, as well as significantly increasing production. The fact that U.S. oil production has been rising while the number of rigs has been declining is consistent with improving efficiency of existing wells. Another driver behind the stronger than expected growth in U.S. oil production this year may be greater uncertainty around the long-term outlook of fossil fuel prices and geopolitical risk. The growth in electric vehicles and clean energy is making U.S. oil companies more wary of investing in projects with long investment cycles. Oil companies have also become more hesitant to invest in offshore projects because they've become more risky in the current geopolitical environment. This is why deploying capital in Permian, where it's cheaper to produce oil than offshore, and where it takes less time to make a profit, has become very attractive. The bottom line is that, at least in theory, U.S. oil production could keep increasing in the foreseeable future as long, of course, as oil prices remain higher than the cost of drilling. The average cost of production in the Permian is only $45 per barrel. This is a problem for Russia and the rest of the OPEC+. Plus. Potentially, of course, a big problem. The 
the Saudis have seen this movie before. In fact, twice in the past 10 years. And each time, it responded the same way. In 2015, in the face of surging U.S. oil production, the Saudis decided to gamble and play the long game. Instead of cutting its oil production to support prices, Riyadh boosted output to maintain its global market share. The result was a collapse in oil price. By early 2016, oil prices fell to below $30 a barrel. But in time, the Saudis' gamble paid off. The collapse of oil price drove many high-priced U.S. shell producers into bankruptcy, which allowed oil price to recover. The Saudi confronted a similar situation in 2020. Rising oil production in the U.S. and Russia placed the Saudi's global market share at risk. Riyadh once again decided to boost production. The result was another collapse in the oil price to below $20 a barrel. This is the million dollar question for 2024. Will the Saudis respond to rising competition and falling prices the same way by boosting its oil production again? I don't know the answer, but what I do know is that Saudi oil production after the sharp cuts over the past year is now near a decade low. What I do know is that the Saudi economy has barely grown this year and the Saudi budget deficit will reach 2% of GDP. What I also know is that a price war will hurt the U.S. shell oil industry, much less so in the past, as producers there have gotten bigger and meaner. And there's little doubt that a price war will hurt the Russian economy much more than the U.S. economy. So how will the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman balance these competing considerations? We may be soon reaching the moment of truth for the BRICS group that now controls more than 40% of the world's oil production. For the BRICS to retain its aspiration to challenge the U.S. hegemony, Russia needs to win the war in Ukraine. And a collapse in oil price will weaken Putin and strengthen Biden ahead of their re-elections. One thing is clear, Saudi's decision will have a major impact on the power struggle between the unipolar world and the multipolar one. Until now, MBS has good reason to think that the interests of Saudi Arabia and the interests of the multipolar world are perfectly aligned. This may not stay that way for long. A lot is riding, of course, on the outlook of Chinese growth. Stronger Chinese economic growth next year could spare MBS from having to make a decision that hurts his friend Putin. This is a good reason for MBS to sit on his hands for a little while longer. I'm thinking that he waits at least until the spring of next year to give Putin a little bit more time to break the Ukrainian defenses on the Eastern Front and to give Xi Jinping more time to get his economy on its feet. I suspect MBS will extend the production cuts for a few more months, but it seems to me that the balance of risk for oil price next year is moving slowly to the downside. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com.